problems get in the way of interpreting the Cambrian explosion as a real explosion of animal origins. The first is our gradual realization that not everything in the fossil record looks very much like living animals. The fossil record is stuffed with so-called stem groups, that is, animals that have features of living taxa but diverge in important ways, mostly because evolution does not create finished products in one fell swoop. Instead, evolution tinkers and adds features that eventually become the familiar animals of today. A second realization in paleontology is the revolution afforded by molecular clocks, which really turned the field upside down. In this video, we'll deal with the stem group problem, and we'll save the molecular clocks for later. We classify metazoans based on their animal body symmetry, their growth and development, and tissue layers. For instance, the sponges have no proper tissues, just cells differentiated for different functions. Sponges can be cut into chunks, and these will regrow into whole sponges. Worse, they can be blended up in a blender, and the goop left over can reassemble into a sponge. In contrast, the cnidarians, the selenerates, and the tenophores have two thin tissue layers called the ectoderm uh, and the endoderm that are separated by a gelatinous layer called the mesoglea. Things like jellyfish typically have radial symmetry. Thanks to modern genetics, we now know that tenophores seem to have branched off before the sponges, showing that there has been repeated independent evolution of tissue-grade organization in metazoans. Now, all the other animals are bilaterally symmetrical. This is even the case in animals with five-fold symmetry like echinoderms, where bilateral symmetry has been lost in adults, but is still seen in larvae. Bilateral symmetry means there is a left and a right, and a front and a back. One of the most striking differences is the organization of body cavities. Imagine taking a jellyfish and a worm and cutting them in two to look at their cross-sections. Diploblasts have a jelly-filled interior space called the mesoglea that separates the ectoderm and the endoderm, and they include things like the jellyfish. Triploblasts, on the other hand, like the worm, have an an outer ectoderm or skin, a gut surrounded by an endoderm, and a mesoderm that lines the interior body cavity, and a fluid-filled space called the coelom. Now, because the coelom is fluid-filled and the fluids like water are incompressible, the animal can push against the fluid-filled balloon with its muscles to change shape and crawl or burrow. We can simulate this motion with a balloon. So here we go. You know, our balloon-shaped animal can use circular muscles that squeeze the sea loam inside, okay, around the outside. The animal can burrow by squeezing its snout, okay, and pushing this into the sediment in front of it. Um, then, later on, the muscles can squeeze and expand that snout, forcing open a crack. Um, the animal, later on, can compress this once again, okay, and, and do the whole motion all over again. So... The aft end of the animal expands, locking the worm into its burrow so it has firm perches to shove its head forward into the crack developing in front of it. Then the middle of the worm is squeezed, expanding the head and opening the crack still more. The animal burrows by this repeated compressing and expanding of different parts of its body to wedge its way forward in sediment. Burrowing is a great idea because the animal can literally mine the sediment for food. Now, besides body organization, we can look at other innovations to determine the pattern of relationships between the major metazoan groups. We must work with shared derived characters to build a phylogenetic tree that shows who's related to whom. Notably, we find animals all have the typical traits of their living representatives. For instance, we can find fossils like trilobites that molt, they have a skeleton, they have segmented bodies and jointed limbs. We call these fossils that are easily assigned to living groups members of the so-called crown group. The problem is that not all fossils are like this, particularly in the early Cambrian. For instance, there are fossils of arthropod-like things without jointed limbs. These are definitely not members of living groups like crabs, lobsters, or shrimp, all of which are perhaps most distinctive because of their jointed limbs. Cambrian fossils include things like hallucigenia, that appears to be related to living velvet worms, but has these crazy armor plates and spines on its side that are not present in living animals. We also have this trouble in younger fossils. For instance, the first whale, a thing called Pachycetus, has four limbs, a fat tail without a fluke, and no dorsal fin, quite unlike modern whales. 
So all these fossils that are similar to, but not quite, members of the crown groups are called stem groups. More formally, crown group taxa include the last common ancestor of all the living representatives of a clade, plus all of its descendants. These things are things that biologists can actually study directly. Stem taxa, on the other hand, include all the extinct forms that diverged before the crown. I mention crown and stem groups here because the stem groups actually show us how evolution unfolded. It might not be obvious that a stem arthropod may not have had jointed legs uh, or no segmentation, but the fossils actually show us. Likewise, a whale trundling around on four limbs on land violates most of what we think about when we contemplate whales. But the beauty is that fossils show us where the modern things came from. The bottom line is that the fossil record traces the specific pathways by which animals came to be. The changing organization of diploblasts and triploblasts also paints a picture of increasing motility of animals, particularly when they evolve sea loams and can start to burrow. As it turns out, burrows are an amazing innovation because they allow animals to start to mine organic matter buried in seafloor sediments for the first time in Earth history. Before the evolution of the sea loam, any organic matter and nutrient that was buried in sediments was utterly lost to the biosphere. It might be a hundred million years before the sediment was subducted and carbon belched out of a volcano and back into the biosphere. Think of that! Life massively, massively speeds up organic matter recycling. Second, the abundance of stem groups in the early Cambrian is perhaps the purest evidence that evolution is real. Animals do not pop into existence through special creation but develop distinctive traits over time, often a long time, as the crown groups are assembled. The Cambrian explosion was like that, with the weird wonders of stem groups ridiculously well preserved in the Chen Jiang Formation and the Burgess Shale. As it happens, this long drawn out appearance of metazoans turns out to actually have been even longer than a glance at the fossil record might suggest, as we shall see next.